a little all the time, so you have to wait a few minutes. But we have a few housekeeping things. For those of you that have not already signed up for membership, we are a membership group. Um, you don't have to sign up. Uh, it is a free meeting, but we do have a few little extras that come with membership, and it's a, it's a nice thing, and we do appreciate when you do that. Okay, the other thing is, back in the back, we always have our flyer for what's coming up, and um, Ronnie puts up flyers all over the place in Squirrel Hill, so you can see them at the bagel factory, at the library, at the teeth, and so they'll be up there somewhere if you, if you haven't seen them and you don't have one. The next month, we have April 14th, we have Jim Rich, who is the former president of the uh, Squirrel Hill Merchants Association, and he's going to talk about Squirrel Hill retailing. 1966 to present, so that should be interesting. Some of the stores that are no longer here, um, that's the way it goes. Um, then in May, we have, again, Elizabeth Rourke, our professor of art and art history from Chatham, who is going to come and talk to us on the history of Pittsburgh in prints and photography, 1800 to 1900. And she has some wonderful prints. So she will be here May 12th. And then we have um, something new this year. This will be two walking tours. We have a walking tour May 16th, and that information will be out for registering for the walking tour. And this will be for the business district of uh, Squirrel Hill, which will be, you know, fall right in line with next month's retail group. So we will have that information for you, and it is limited to a certain number. So, and Marianne will be leading that group, and she's done that before, and that has turned out very, very well. Then we have a new one, June 6th, which will be the walking tour of Chatham University. And that we are doing in conjunction with the Chatham University group. They have a tour person who will take us through, and that information will be available next month. Or you can look on the website, or you can call the number down here. We're always happy to give you any information we can. Then, in June 9th, we have our lovely Betty Conley, who just came in, Betty, who is a member who is going to monitor and handle a program called I Went to School in Squirrel Hill. And this is one where you are engaged to bring your pictures, tell your stories about all the Squirrel Hill um, schools so that we can put it on video and have it for all, the, our, all of our historians later than us. So that's what's coming up, and as I said, we always have these in the back, so make sure you pick up one. Coming up also, we will be at the library on March 29th, Sunday, for Won't You Be My Neighbor Day. The library is putting on a little program with all the various uh, organizations, volunteer groups, that will have tables there, and you'll be able to find out what's going on in your community. And that's from 1 until 4 on Sunday, March 29th, so we will be there for that. Now, if you do not have, if you do not get an email from us, and you would like to get an email, sign up, we do have a registration sheet in the back. If you just put your name and your email address, we will make sure we keep you posted on everything that goes on. And if you have an organization or a group of something that's going on, feel free to bring in the brochures for our meetings and put them back there, and we will post them up. On April 26th, we have another Squirrel Hill cleanup day. And I don't know whether any of you have been to the Squirrel Hill cleanup days. They're wonderful. They put food out. They're all happy little <laughs> folk. They love cleaning up. So, you know, it is very, very nice to attend. So you can do that. Now, that's all we have for our little uh, stuff. So I think we're going to make a couple more minutes for a few, see if we have a few more stragglers come in, and then we'll start our meeting. Okay? Introduction, a copy introduction of the book. It's the second page in, so I'll. I'll well, maybe I should it. introduce you. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I should uh, introduce. Oh no, I, I worked this up. <laughs> this is good stuff. Okay. Here we go. Our speaker for tonight is Dr. Quentin Scrabeck, right? A Pittsburgher who has been transplanted to Ohio. Sorry about that. A successful management career in the steel industry, currently Associate Professor of Business Teaching Courses in Operations Management at Findlay University. He has a long list of academic degrees, including PhD in Manufacturing Management, MS in um, Metallurgy and Industrial Engineering, and you could go on and on and on, and we would be here all night talking about all his degrees. 
He's written numbers of articles and ten, is it ten? Or Seventeen more? books. No. Seventeen no. books? No. Oh boy, he really packs his book. In history, industrial history, business, he is a much sought after speaker. He's appeared in over 30 national gatherings. And last year, one of his speak speaking appearances was at the annual North American Jules Verne Society. Right? <laughs> I love that. Um, Metallurgy of Jules Verne. <laughs> Fabulous. So we're pleased to have him back. He was here last in December 2007. He spoke on his book, The Boys of Braddock, one of the trio of the 19th century Pittsburgh industrialists. Um, so today he's going to speak on the Westinghouse, a gentle genius, and he has a, the third trilogy of that was the Metallurgical Age. And you are now working on, uh, you have another one coming up? will be out in May, and uh, Frick, Frick will be out in a year and a half. Okay. <laughs> so he's just going on and on and on. Now, one other little piece of trivia, I just love that. As a youth, at the Buell Planetarium, of course, which is part of what's now the Science Center of the new building, he received the Werner von Braun Award for building a small steam engine. Uh, so now yeah. we have Dr. Clinton Straybeck. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know the gentleman was for many, many years. It was born in one run, actually gave me a little award. Bill Planetarium was a lot of little awards for science projects. But uh, it took me years later to figure out he was such an important man. Biography just came out. Um, Okay, what I'm passing around, I say, in there is the introduction from the book, which actually talks, I started the book, I like to start books at, at places that deal with the people, uh, and I'm working really on a pantheon of industrialists, um, at the uh, uh, memorial here in Shillman Park. How many have been to the memorial? Okay, most of it. It's hard to get to. <clears throat> was when I went there <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, and I went back a couple times, and uh, it used, by the way, uh, if you didn't know, just to mention, I'll mention it later, but since you'll be viewing that, um, the, the panels are actually aluminum, okay? They're bronze coated. They originally were gold plated, but they were vandalized over the years. The thin gold plate, but enough, enough to scrape plenty of money off of it. <laughs> uh, so, and they refurbished it, I believe, oh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. It, it, it's, it's in really good shape. It's very, like I said, it's very hard to get there if you were just a, unless you're a walker and you were in Shinman Park doing the weed, they park down along. Okay, enough of that. Okay, say I'm really working on the golden corner there in Shadyside where uh, Westinghouse and Hines and Frick are all neighbors uh, and, and friends to various degrees. Uh, but we'll start with Westinghouse because um, Westinghouse really didn't come out of the Pittsburgh area, it was from New York. It was connected to New York, actually, which is sort of unusual, because that's all, that's the birthplace of General Electric, which was one of his competitors. Let but, me just turn this off then, we don't need it on. Oh, you can. Leave it on? Yeah. Leave it on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most people like to, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll point to it once in a while, okay. you get different things. Born in 1846, uh, uh, sorry. Um, as a kid, he really he went to, he, he he really never showed much genius. He liked mechanics. He, he always did. He, he wasn't much into the main part of uh, schooling, um, uh, reading and writing. He didn't care too much for. Uh, he was trained. He did remember that he was trained by McGuffey. He did use the McGuffey reader. Another gentleman I started to write about only because everybody that seemed to be a cross. McGuffey seemed to be something that everybody had in common of the industrialists I wanted to write about. Particularly Henry Ford, who really loved McGuffey. But anyhow, Westinghouse was another one of these guys that, that was inspired by the McGuffey readers. Uh, they said he went to Union College up in uh, New York, small college. He only went for a couple years. He went into, uh, at the time, it would have probably been... Um, um, some, I don't know what it would have been called. It, been more, it wasn't engineering, but I mean, that's basically what it was. It was I think they call it natu natural philosophy and the arts. Um, and uh, so he got some training. Um, he turned out to be very good at math. 
in college. That was one of his, that's one of his real strengths. Um, he um, enlisted against his family. His family were German. I didn't, I didn't mention that. Um, most of the Germans, especially from that era, the 1840s, uh, the first German migration, were pacifists. Um, although they're all abolitionists, they're also pacifists. Really didn't believe much in the war, but he, his father did let him go. And he actually uh, um, worked his way up to a, a lieutenant in the Navy. Uh, and he uh, was assigned a short period. He, he was working on steam engines, believe it or not. That's sort of where he got. He was a mechanic for, for a steam engine on a, on a ship, where he spent most of his time. Uh, came back from, call, from the war. Uh, and really started to work at his father's shop. Now his father was sort of had sort of had a, a black a combination farm blacksmith shop, sort of a handyman for the town. Uh, did a lot of repair work. By the way, um, please interrupt because I know some of you we've heard some of this, and you know you can ask your questions as as we go at the, at the point. Um, and in fact, that sometimes it's helpful. Um, what he got interested in, he did, he did want to become an inventor. He was one of these guys that did, you know, did have that sort of a, a, a dream. And uh, he got interested in railroads after he came back from the war. Uh, he was a young man still when he came back. He went, he went at 17, he came back, he was, uh, I don't think he was quite 20 yet, just, just before he was 20 years old. So very, very interested in the railroad. He thought his future might be there. And he started to, to work on things not work for anybody, but work on particular inventions. Um, one of the things that, that was badly needed at the time was called a railroad frog. And it's a, it's a, it's a rail, the, the trains used to dis derail a lot. And this railroad frog is sort of like a little connection you put on there to help them get it back, a wedge, sort of help them get them back on the track. Um, now, he didn't invent it, they had, they had similar things, but the material for it was, was very hard to uh, find. They made them out of cast iron, they didn't hold up very well, cast iron sort of brittle. So he came up with the idea, he wanted to make them out of steel. Steel wasn't a big material at the time. Remember, this is around 1867. Pittsburgh didn't have steel at that um, Had some foundries making steel uh, here. Carnegie had built, he didn't build his first mill till here until 1875. So he started to look for a place to manufacture what they called steel frogs. Um, and uh, he finally came to Pittsburgh because we had some foundries here um, on the north side. Uh, that's where he started his business, his railroad business. Uh, you might not think there might have been much money in those frogs, but there were a lot of money in it. <clears throat> he made a fairly good amount in a short time. He, um, he met some important industrialists. One of, the, one of the guys was Ralph Bagley. He was an important Pittsburgh industrialist at the time. He was a manufacturer on the north side. Uh, then it was Allegheny City. Um, had several foundries. So he, he made some, some pretty important ties. And he also started to make some pretty important railroad ties. Because he set up the manufacturing. Okay? And then he also liked to sell. He went on the road to sell these frogs. And he'd sell you know, to all the major railroads at the time. Um, and he, he spent a lot of time traveling on the train. That was, again, that was what he liked to do. Um, and in, with, with his experience then, in you know, a few years, like say by about 1870, uh, well, let's say 1869, made a fair amount of money, and he was looking for another investment to expand his plant. And that's when he got interested in the braking system. Uh, railroad cars did not have um, a good braking system. They had a hand brake, is what they had. And you still see that. They still have hand brakes even to this day. That's that wheel you see at the, at the end of the car. And uh, you, very difficult to brake. You had a brake man on each car. Okay? Um, and they, when they blew the whistle, sequence that they had to turn those wheels at about the same time. You wanted everything to break pretty much the same or you get a, a real jump. And the jumps were, were common, disrailing jumps, things like that. On top of it all, it was a very dangerous job. And the only, usually it was Irish immigrants that did the job. Death rate was very high, okay. 
Uh, usually, death rate was around 10,000 brakemen a year, believe it or not, in the United States. Very difficult job, because that brakeman, also, he had to get to the other side. He had to go across, when it was rainy and sleety, he'd be on top of those cars, going down, trying to get to the wheel. So it was a very, very dangerous job. Okay? Um, and the railroads didn't really care, because it, the immigrants' time were pretty, you know, there was plenty of people who lining up to take the job. It still paid pretty good compared to other jobs. Uh, so Westinghouse really had to sell them on the idea of this air brake, which he had started to invent. Um, and the air brake, um, the air brake uh, basically uses compressed air um, to, to, to push shoes against a, a wheel. And it can be synchronized. Compressed air is real nice because you can do it as a switch at the locomotive. And the, the line, it'd be a line, actual rubber line and hose, and you could break in sequence and break it, you know, the whole train without a lot of disruption. So it would and, and there were lots more to that invention. There was triple valves and all kinds of things that he improved on. But the air brake was his uh, his main um, idea. There were some competing brakes. He, he was in a number of uh, competitions in the 1870s. There were electrical brakes at the time. There were, uh, let's see, uh, electrical, there, were, there was a chain system brake too. Sort of like one chain sort of pulled. Uh, there were some people using steam brakes. They were using steam down the line. You can use any, anything that, you know, pressed air is the, the, the most efficient. Um, so he made a lot of money, he made a lot of money in the air brake system. And he was manufacturing air brakes for the world by 1870, uh, 1875, I'm sorry. He was pretty much shipping them. He had big contracts in Brazil, South America. But they're only being replaced now, if you're aware of that. I, yeah, and I didn't know they were, they were being replaced. I, paid, I know they're, they're still, the air brake is still a common system. Yeah, but they're being replaced by slowly. Electrical? You know, or you know, the computer controls. Okay, I've got. And yeah, and you know, so it was really a, a good system to last that long. Uh, he did get the idea. Where he got the idea, it wasn't quite he, where he claims he got the idea was. Uh, they were drilling. They were using comp compressed air for mines. The first long tunnel was being drilled in New York in, in the late 1860s through a mountain, a three-mile tunnel through a mountain, and. Um, to do that, they were using compressed air to run the drill bits. Did he have a hand in converting it for trucks, or the trucks came later? Uh, trucks came later. He did get into automotive right at the end of his life, automotive brakes. <clears throat> um, it was one of the last things he dabbled in. But he was never really successful at it. <laughs> You'll see that he... Uh, Sort of had a tough ending, as you might say. His last, his last 10 years were not that great for him personally. Let's see, he lost several of the companies. But he, most people don't know outside of Pittsburgh. They made most of his money in the air brakes. Anybody know what his second big, and it wasn't electric. Yeah. Gas. Yes. Um, he had a house. Uh, he had moved. He, he had lived several places they lived with his wife. Um, and he, he brought his wife in from New York, by the way. He, they got married up in Schenectady. They had lived in Allegheny City, more side, in, in, in a little German section there. Um, as he made enough money, he moved over to um, Shadyside. Um, well, first he moved to Oakland, I should say. Uh, and while he was there a few years, they were building their mansion in Shadyside, which today is a little park, not far from Frick's Clayton House. Um, Anyhow, at the time, they had discovered, and this is the 1880s, 1883 about, okay, roughly. They had discovered gas in, uh, out by Connellsville in Pennsylvania, natural gas. Uh, they had also discovered, one of the gentlemen was here from Finley. They had discovered in Finley, uh, in Ohio, and uh, West Virginia. So people were starting to drill for gas to use it to heat homes and so forth as an energy source. Uh, Westinghouse got interested in this. You know, he was always he was an inventor. He really said that. He was out looking for inventions, a lot like Edison did. Um, so he wanted to get into this. And he actually drilled his first gas well right down here in Shadyside, at his home, in his backyard. Uh, 
and he did hit a gas button. And it flared up for a number of months, lit up the Pittsburgh area. They, they, taught, they have pictures of it, you can find. Uh, he did cap it. There wasn't a lot of gas there, but it got him into the business. Um, he then started to buy out some of the gas companies, gas wells and closer uh, to Connorsville. And what he really became big at wasn't so much that. The drilling was, was you know, the technology was there, it was the transmission of gas. He decided, well, they have the gas pockets out in Connorsville were pretty good. If he could get the gas to Pittsburgh, he could convert houses to gas. So his transmission systems became um, a, a very important um, part. And they were very simple. And later they would be the system that he used that carried him into his electrical system transmission. He, he very simply used small pipe at the head, so you got very high pressure, and you'd transmit the gas at high <coughs> pressure. And then when he came into the neighborhoods, that gas would come into a larger pipe and drop off the pressure, and then you could move it into houses with less pressure, enough. You know. And there was a while uh, that Pittsburgh, especially this side of Pittsburgh, from about, I have here, about 1885 to 1890, uh, where most of the houses were using gas as heating, and it really cleaned up the air for the shortest period of five years, but it was the only time that Pittsburgh really was pretty clean air-wise. It was still a lot of coal. It was replacing coal burning. Uh, he converted a lot of industry. Carnegie, right away, converted a lot of his mills to gas. So he converted industry over. He converted foundries. He converted a lot of homes to heating. It was a lot better for cooking than the, than the, the use of coal. Um, I had it cheaper here. It's, uh, coal stoves in a house for heating cost around $12.5 a year. Gas would be $1.50 a year. So there's a lot of momentum to switch to it. Um, he, uh, in fact, he did two conversions. But the first conversion, he switched his neighbor, Henry Clay Frick's home, to gas. They were using oil <coughs> for the common lighting system. And he put them on a gas system. A few years later, he switched to electrical. But, um, but he, he had a pretty good business going to gas. Um, one of his neighbors also was very big, H.J. Uh, Hines, um, switched his factories right away to gas. He switched his homes to gas, his home to gas, and uh, his father's home out in, um, I forget now, in the town, huh? Uh, up, up the Allegheny, the Hines is from, I'll think of it on the medical. No, near Fox Chap, it's on the river. Sharpsburg, Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg. <clears throat> he converted most of that town to gas. <clears throat> um, he had, uh, at the time, as the gas started to make him more money, now he, he did have a lot of money. He had a, 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 a nice mansion, uh, they say in Shadyside. He started to look into the, he started to get interested in electrical uh, power. Edison's light bulb um, came about at 1878, um, in the um, 18, early 1880s, Edison had started to build power plants. DC, now all Edison's system was DC, that was the thing. Edison, everything he did was DC. Um, he loved batteries, he was, a, he was a chemist at heart as a kid. So he looked, and DC power can be created by chemicals, so, and it's very simple. Very easy to understand. And he started to build his DC uh, transformer stations up in um, New York. In fact, the first home was uh, J.P. Morgan's home in New York, wealthy financier who, who backed Edison. Um, the problem with Edison's uh, system was, wasn't the light bulb, of course, that was fine. The DC system, you'd have to build a power plant about every three or four blocks. You couldn't transmit that DC power. It didn't have enough voltage. Voltage is pressure. And uh, you couldn't get enough voltage on DC to transmit it very far. So that also meant, in fact, copper prices went through the ceiling. That you had to use a lot of copper as well for wiring and so forth. And uh, that's J.P. Morgan got involved in that because he cornered the copper market also for a while. Um, so the problem was, was not so much um, the electric light bulb at the 
ton from was transmission of energy, again, electricity. This is where Westinghouse got involved. Um, and he really started to look at AC transmission, uh, alternating current. Um, and it was very difficult. Edison didn't want to touch it, because Edison had just, if you know AC, if you're an engineer, AC is a very, hard, very abstract concept compared to DC current. AC, electrical engineers you know, have a very tough time in the early going in college because it's very abstract, very mathematical. It's not like DC. It's not like you, know, you put two ends in a potato and you can create a current. It's abstract. It's, it's alternating. You can create the electricity with engines and magnets. And you know, it's different. Uh, use differential equations, actually, to describe it. Something that Edison was not suited for. Edison had to hire his mathematicians. He hated math, but was very suited for Westinghouse. Uh, so Westinghouse started to really dabble in this while he had his air brake plan. Um, in about 1887, his air brake plant was already over capacity, so he started to move, he built another plant down here in Swissville, in Swissville. He also started at the time, a small little research part of that was going to be on electrical power. So he started to get into the game a little bit. Um, and he was interested at the time, what he was looking at at the time was the application of streetcars, electrical streetcars, mainly. He thought if he could, because they were DC too. He thought, well, if I could get this transmission going, I could, and he eventually did, I could start a streetcar. sort of tie off the railroad system. So he, he was very, very interested in that. Um, he, um, so he started the search to build it. The main problem with, they knew how to generate AC current, okay? The main problem with the, with the transmission was um, you, had to, you had to get the high voltage, which he could get, he figured that out. That wasn't so much the problem. The problem was you couldn't use that high voltage in the home. Okay, you had to step it down. Okay, same is true today. You know, our high, quote, high power lines or high voltage lines, that's for transmitting in a long distance. When you get to the home, you've got to step it down. And to step it down, you need something called a transformer. Okay? And that's where his research started to center on. Now, <clears throat> again, he was into so many things that he wasn't like Edison. He wasn't the guy in the laboratory necessarily playing around. He was the idea man. And he hired a lot of people to play around. Um, and one of the gentlemen, one gentleman he picked up in the, in the late 1880s was Testa, Nikolai Testa. Okay? Um, Testa had been working for Edison, but they just didn't get along. I mean, they were both, quote, geniuses. They, 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 had, they were very opinionated. Uh, they argued a lot. Testa thought that Edison was an idiot in his mind. <laughs> Testa very abstract, mathematical with his electrical equations and things like that. Edison hated that. You know, Edison much better mechanic though. Things like that. You know, he could wire things. Testa was into the, you know, uh, generation and uh, a lot of dynamo uh, power generation and so forth. Um, very, very, very abstract concepts. Uh, and he came to, to, to see Westinghouse, and Westinghouse hired him immediately. Um, and uh, they got along quite, quite, quite well. And Westinghouse just sort of let him go. Westinghouse says, you know what, here's what I think I need to do, run, make a major uh, company. I, I need a transformer and I need an electric motor that can run on AC. Both were the hang-ups at the time. And, and Tesco went on to those projects. And Westinghouse paid him a lot of money. Testa lived really high. When he lived in New York working for Edison, he lived at the Waldorf Astoria. He loved to eat well. He had people over all the time. And uh, he lived in our, what was, at the time was one of our best hotels, the Monongahela House. Um, so Westinghouse had to pay him a lot. <clears throat> but they did like him. Westinghouse and his wife really liked Testa. Westinghouse and his wife had a little tradition. Westinghouse. Uh, they would always have a dinner every night, and they'd have engineers and people, visitors, or whoever there. Testa was there. He was here in town maybe five years, and he spent a lot of time at those Westinghouse dinners. Uh, and, and there were dinners, and then Westinghouse and him would talk in through the night. That's what they liked to do. They'd play pool, you know, 
pool table at the time and then talk into the night. Uh, and they, they did, Westinghouse loved that. He loved to talk with people. Uh, he had a lot of people, famous people, in. I did mention Westinghouse Mansion. He actually uh, had a railroad station, a Pennsylvania Railroad had a station and stuff just for his house. He had a tunnel that went right there. Um, so he had high tides. He also befriended a, a young man, which later became his very good friend. When he was in the, one of the things with the air brakes I forgot to mention was a big fight in this country. It took many years to get that in, by the way. Railroad companies didn't want it, it was expensive, they didn't care. I mean, there was no insurance or legal issues for the immigrants dying, 10,000, didn't mean a lot to them, okay? So they, the government had to really come in, and what Westinghouse, the guy that supported Westinghouse and got the laws passed was a young guy called William McKinley. He was a congressman, he was head of the Ways and Means Committee at the time, in the 1880s. And uh, became very good friends with Westinghouse. He often visited Westinghouse and used Westinghouse railroad car. Westinghouse had a special Pullman car. Most people did in that neighborhood. And uh, so he became very good friends with McKinley. Later on, that would become very important. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he had sort of an insight into uh, to government uh, as, as McKinley became more important over the years. Uh, the power battle. Okay, well, test to make this short, overcame the technical problems. He did come up with a transformer. He did come up with a uh, electric motor, AC. Okay, but now the business side kicked in. Okay, uh, it was no longer Tesco. Was actually Tesco went on to other things by himself, many other projects. I mean, there's lots to read about him. Um, <clears throat> and lots of movies on him. He was such an unusual character that there's been a lot of movies on him, a lot of books. Now it was the business side. He was up against Edison, who was backed now by, it was then called Edison General Electric, who was backed by J.P. Morgan's money. And they already committed to these big power, they were building them, they had them in place. Nobody really wanted to start moving the AC. And this was, you know, so he, he was, he, he was going to have a big battle. He had to somehow convince people of this. And the place he convinced is one of the, the, the panels there was the World's Fair, the 1893 World's Fair. They needed, this was to be the uh, white city, the, it was to be the first World's Fair, first city that was really lit by lights, electric lights. I don't have the number. No, I don't, but uh, huge, huge amount of lighting. Um, and he bid against Edison on the contract for it. Um, and he underbid him. Finally, there were lots of politics that went on. Chicago had, had a machine, a political machine that uh, Morgan owned. Yeah, they still do. And it was the same thing. If you, if you read, that mayor was very corrupt. He eventually went to jail. Uh, and, and that's a story unto itself. But somehow, after a couple bids, because they, they finally, the, I think the United States Congress stepped in, Finally, Westinghouse got it because he had the lower bid. Okay, so now he has the contract for the World's Fair. This is huge. I mean, this is hundreds of thousands of lights. Uh, big. The, the machinery building, the dynamos to run this was huge. It was going to be a block long. Uh, just the generation plant. So big. He won it. He's all set. He starts the work. This is 1891. The fair's coming up in a couple of years. He had Morgan and Edison do another business move. They still own legally the patent rights to the light bulb <laughs> and that, that he needed. <laughs> you know, he was going to supply AC, and the Edison bulb would work on that. But, so Edison, they wouldn't supply any light bulbs. And he needed, again, he needed hundreds and thousands of light bulbs. Uh, so he had to sort of invent his own, and it wasn't a very good one, but he got the job done. It was a, sort of a glass stopper instead of a metal stopper on the bottom light bulb. And he opened up a little plant over on the north side of Pittsburgh just for the fair, and for two years they cranked out light bulbs for the fair. And uh, so he could keep that <laughs> business and get around the patent. He bought this old patent, it had been another patent, a competing patent nobody had used. And these light bulbs burn out about every eight hours. So he had an army of people replacing them. That he had something like 400 people at the fair just replacing light bulbs around the clock. 
Um, so it was a real problem, but he wanted to win. It was a, he, he thought if he could show that you know, AC Park could light this with one plant, and, and it did turn out to be the success. Okay? Uh, and eventually it would come back. J.P. Morgan would get him back, but he, the uh, AC sort of, after that, AC Power started to win the contracts around the country. And Edison and DC Power sort of were going by the wayside. Um, now the problem began, everybody wanted ACs by the time, by the end of the 1890s, okay? They needed a huge power source. And this is where Niagara Falls comes in. <laughs> um, where Edison um, put together some financers and uh, they went to build a power plant at Niagara Falls, still there today. This was to be the world's biggest power plant. Um, I do, I don't know why I don't have the voltage, but I do have here that, let's see, um, every hour, the, the falls just falling over, the water falling over create, is equal to, um, 100,000 tons of coal per hour. So it was called white coal but in Niagara Falls. It had so much power. Now it took them several years to build that plant. You know, I, the book gets, I could get into all the technology here, make certain runs on the side where the water would come down. And, and, uh, it was all Testa's patents, by the way. Testa was still the main consultant. Um, in fact, Westinghouse never cared. He always gave credit, too. That was another, Edison never gave credit. Edison patents were always, he'd have his own research people, but he'd always have his name on it. Uh, if you go to Niagara Falls, there's, 20, there's a plaque of the 21 patents that made it all possible, and, and 20 of those are Testa's, and one is Westinghouse. Um, and he knew that. He, he paid what Testa, and he always credited Testa. Always. And like I say, they were good friends to the end. Testa went broke a couple times, and Westinghouse had to lend him money. Um, you know, like I say, Testa spent money. Like he, he was, you know, he, he was a real party guy. He, he, <laughs> believe it or not, he, he was an immigrant. He came over. He was an Hungarian, actually, and uh, but he really enjoyed the highway. Um, so, you know, I'm doing here on time. Too bad. You can ask questions. I don't know if I'm going where you want to go or not. Okay, now maybe to that, so that takes us to maybe the more interesting thing. At, in the end of the 1890s, with building Niagara, he needs a new, couple new factories, and that's where he comes into Wilmerding, East Pittsburgh, and those complexes. Most of those were built to build the original dynamos to go to uh, Niagara Falls. And then uh, up the river, or up the valley a little more, he built a foundry, Built a whole complex, if you're from out that area. He had East Pittsburgh, Wilmerding, uh, and, um, <clears throat> what is it, Trap? Uh, Pitcairn. Huh? Pitcairn. Uh, a whole complex where he built and uh, assembled uh, not only dynamos, the big stuff, which were huge. He built the biggest factories in the world <laughs> at the time, but also all his systems, his lighting systems. He was still playing around with his old light bulbs. He was making about everything you can think of. He had some neon type light. He had some special lighting too, I didn't mention. He had a lot of side, little side inventions he was making. They've since died, but basically he had some neon lighting type inventions that were popular. He also had some arc lighting, which is real powerful lighting and some other things. Uh, he, was making, he was looking into electrical trains. He was moving into that out in East Pittsburgh, he had an experimental yard there. He had an experimental electric train in his mansion. Uh, it was a trolley, really. Um, uh, so he had a lot of things going. And of course, he, uh, he built this new factory, and he built the town. He wanted to build a, a sort of, he was a paternal, we'll talk about that now. He sort of was a paternal capitalist. He wanted to take care of his employees. So he built this special town, in a way, long thing. Um, and he lived out here. Train. He took the radio at his own station, but he took the train to East Pittsburgh each morning. Came home at night. Um, so, um, but the town was very important to him, and he built special. He had done this in Swissville earlier with his air brake plant. He had built factory. He had built housing, pretty good housing, and he would help the workers uh, get mortgages. He would pay for some of the down payment. But it, in 1890s, in the, the ones he built in Swissville, I know, were around three thousand dollars. There were four bed, uh, five room, five room, not four bed, 
five room. Uh, and uh, he, he paid for about half of that and got the mortgage for, for the rest for the workers. So he did a lot of that. He put in retirement plans before anybody else. Um, his workforce, though, on the smaller jobs, other than H.J. Hines, well, he was actually a bigger employer of women than H.J. Hines, but he used a lot of women. Uh, that was a, the first thing. And uh, while he did all these good things for his workers, now I'm talking about 1890s, 1900, he still paid women half, the going rate for women was roughly half wages. And he was consistent with everybody else in that. H.J. Hines did that. There were no women allowed in the steel mills or the mines by law. So uh, What he got was there was lots of extra labor because at that time he picked up most of the immigrants coming in uh, from Europe. Uh, the daughters would work for a few years to make money and the wives would work for a few years. So it was always a good labor source. His employees only averaged about four years, the women. But he had special lunch rooms for them and so forth. Other than the half pay issue, there would probably be no other issue. Yes? Since you mentioned women, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Westinghouse was, uh, the company at least, was, I believe, the first company to hire a woman engineer. Yep. Uh, and she was the sister of one of his top managers, Lummy. Right. Who mm -hmm. told Westinghouse she's really good. Mm -hmm. and could he hire her? And Westinghouse said yes. Yeah. And she was one of the first graduates of Ohio, Ohio State's State. electric engineering department, which he financed. And she lived to used to take the train with him. She lived out, I'm not exactly sure, not in the rich, real rich part of Shays, but out there. I think some of her family is still living here. I think you're right. Her, her dad was a pretty famous engineer. Yes. One of those back, he's mentioned in the book, he's one of those guys behind the scenes that, that did a lot of work on um, uh, the electrical motor. But yeah, his daughter was the first graduate electrical engineer in Westinghouse, was the first to hire one. And, uh, <clears throat> and my, my grandfather and father worked at Westinghouse Airbrake and Woolworthing, and the story in our family is that at one time, George Westinghouse went through the Airbrake plant in Woolworthing and gave everybody little pieces of paper and said IOU because he didn't have the money right there yeah. to pay him. <clears throat> They did get paid, but uh, they got a little paper that said, I owe you. Yeah. He did, he did many things like that. He was very good with his workers. And he, you could get, if you could get to him, sometimes his managers weren't as good. If you could get to, as they got bigger, if you could get to Westinghouse, you had a problem, he would give you a little money or, or help you out. You know, he, he was very good like that. Um, he built many YMCAs. Walmart was one of his first, but he was very big on YMCAs. That was one of his. You don't hear much of his uh, giving. In fact, Westinghouse used to say, because they used to talk about that, because you had Carnegie at the time giving all the money. And Westinghouse used to say giving people a decent job was his philanthropy. I and mean, that's how he viewed it. And um, I say he gave half wages to him, but his wages overall were pretty good. And if you take into the consideration that all of his factors, and this was unusual at the time, had doctors, and nurses, and you know, you got basically free health care if anything was wrong with your family. So it, it, there were a lot of, of good side benefits that most people didn't get at that time in, in his work. Uh, they say, I did mention he was German, he did go back to Germany. He got the ideas from the Germans who were, hey, at the time, they were worried about socialism coming in. And so was Westinghouse. In fact, Westinghouse even hated unions. Not many people know that. But one of the ways they thought the alternative was there was this paternal type capitalism take care of people decently and you wouldn't have these issues. And uh, so that's the way he went. So did H.J. Hines. Yes. Yeah, did did uh, Westinghouse and other industries have the 12 hour, 7 day work week like no. the steel mills did? No, no. Uh, Originally, his was, uh, that's a good point though, he did do some unusual things. His days for the men were nine hours and women were seven, I believe, which was about standard. The mills were, were, were right, around 12 at the time. Um, he was one of the first, in fact, the first to uh, give Sundays off in Pittsburgh. And then he went to, he was one of the first to go half days on Saturday. Um, he was a big believer in that. No one had ever done anything like that. I mean, Sundays, some had, but nobody had ever started this half-day Saturday stuff, so that people could have more time with families. Again, it was another part of that paternalism who thought, 
Another question I had yeah, is, yeah. is the name Westinghouse, was it anglicized or was that his name? His, his it's anglicized. Name in German. Yeah, it's anglicized. Is, is his mansion still uh, standing? No, there's a park there now, a little park. Uh, it's not far from Frick. Frick was his neighbor and uh, H.J. Hines' house is gone too. A.J. Hines was his other neighbor on the other side. Um, I think I'm not sure if the shady side picture. One of them has some pictures. It's off of Thomas Boulevard. In, yes. In Homewood. Oh, there's a bank in Wolverine, Compass Bank, that has huge uh, 12 by 15 pictures of uh, Westinghouse Air Break, uh, Westinghouse's mansion. Yeah. And the YMCA that he built in the castle. castle. And they also have fold out postcards of all these pictures. And you yeah. can buy them in that small Yeah, bag. I have. I have a, actually a postcard. I know the, the one mansion yeah. here. And, and yeah, he built so he built the beautiful the castle, which is still there. Did have the, the West, all the Westinghouse stuff now is down at Hines Museum. But uh, up until a few years ago, when I started the book, it was all out there. All the archives, and everything was in Wilmerding. Uh, that's where he had to go for it. And uh, the castle still exists, and the Y YMCA and all that. Uh, like I say, he, that was one of his big. We poured a lot of money into the YMCA's in general. We really liked that. He also poured a lot of money, as they all were at the time, they were Republicans, uh, the Republican Party. But Pittsburgh was run by a Republican machine up until the 1920s. Pittsburgh always voted Republican. In fact, the one thing few people even know, Pittsburgh's the birthplace of the Republican Party. First convention of the Republicans was 1856 here. So, <laughs> almost forgotten. But, um, yeah, he poured a lot of money. He was a big friend of William McKinley. Like I said, well, William McKinley, of course, went on to become president. Um, and they stayed good friends. In fact, Westinghouse built two, what do you want to call them, summer homes. I don't, one was clearly a summer home in New York in the Berkshire Hills area. Uh, and he lived maybe half, towards the end, he was spending about six months there. His wife liked that because Pittsburgh was pretty dirty by then. And uh, he also built, when McKinley was president, Built, he built, he bought. In du if you've ever been to Washington, there's a wealthy section called DuPont Circle. Uh, he bought, at the time, the guy had run for president a couple times. His name was James Blaine, uh, a Republican. And he bought that house when McKinley was there because he used to go to parties with McKinley and, and so forth. And, and like I say, they remained good friends. McKinley visited them here, we visited them up in New York. Uh, they remained very good friends. Uh, do, I guess I'll quickly move to the sadder part of the story. There's lots to talk about and read about and all this work with employees. Certainly that's probably what he's best known for. Um, 1907 was a tough year for him though. Uh, that was the panic in 1907. Something like we had today. Uh, in fact, very similar. Very similar. A large insurance company uh, known as Equable in New York. Crash. Couldn't pay its... Uh, policies that sent the stock market into a huge crash. Um, liquidity banks dried up. And in those days, you didn't have a Federal Reserve. And um, what they did was, and Westinghouse on his electrical side, well, he had always he had many companies, he had them all separated. Well, West Airbrake was one thing. And Westinghouse with electric, which really was his favorite now. I mean that's the one he loved at the end. Okay, he had because of the fair and a lot of things. He had a lot of loans out. Well, when the liquidity crashed in those days, they called in the loans literally. They said, "Okay, you owe us ten thousand, you know, and you've been paying six percent, but now we need the ten thousand." Okay, and they had to get refinanced. Well, Westinghouse had never liked the bankers. He uh, had never got along with them, uh, and in the end, of course, J.P. Morgan and, and controlled that crisis. J.P. Morgan was the Federal Reserve at that time. And he sort of let Westinghouse go bankrupt, uh, mainly because he owned General Electric, which is the main competitor. So it was an opportunity to let Westinghouse Electric go bankrupt. Now, bankrupt, is, it was sort of unusual because they reported their highest profits that year. <laughs> he had lots of business, he just couldn't cover his loans, which wouldn't have been a problem in normal business. Or, or even today, that wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, so 
you know, he really, and he went into depression after that. He was never quite the same. He kept his other companies, Airbrake and so forth. But he was never quite the same man. Uh, he played around with some other inventions. He was working on car brakes and things like that. And he, and he still had air brake out in the East Pittsburgh area. And he still had some plants. Uh, but he never quite got out of it losing that business. The press was very hard on him. They say he lost it. Again, this was Morgan behind it. Morgan owned most of the press. Um, you know, there, it was bad management, which it really wasn't. But uh, it was clearly Morgan taking you know, uh, letting that go, letting him fall, so he could have General Electric and, and Westinghouse out of the picture. Now, Westinghouse never went quite out of the picture, though. It, it did let, remain on as a company. It survived, but uh, it worked in agreement with General Electric for many years because of the money. The, the bankers saved it through Morgan, and they had sort of an alliance for many years. Was Morgan the root of that panic in 1997? Well, no. Generally, though, he's called the savior, if you really want to. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much. He, he wanted, that was also when he took over, uh, and he got into a lot of trouble though, in Congress for years later. <coughs> Doing that same panic, he let Westinghouse go under. He also let a little comp a big company called Tennessee Coal and Iron. He took that over for United States Steel. It was with that they got sued for monopoly. Uh, that went into court for many years. And wasn't and was one settled in 1920, uh, and Frick was involved in that. And that was the other unusual thing. Frick at this time was in Morgan's library most of the time during the panic. Frick worked for Morgan, and he was also a good friend of um, Mellon's. And Frick, sort of Frick didn't really step in to help us. That was sort of unusual. He sort of because they were friends, believe it or not. And he had rewired Frick's house a couple for get he had, he had lined up for gas, rewired it for electrical. They played poker together every Thursday when they were in town. Um, so that was sort of unusual, although Westinghouse never complained about that. He complained about the bankers. They always did. He really didn't like bankers, and he really couldn't keep his mouth shut on that one thing. So he was never liked by the Mellons, and the Mellons could have helped them too. They turned him down to help cover those loans. He went to New York, and then Morgan. <laughs> so... Um, and he really went into depression after that, like I said. It was a really personal depression. And he, uh, he died in 1914. He, um, yeah, he had a lot of problems, but I, I think the final thing was heart. But, uh, they said he was never quite right. He lived mainly in New York then, uh, Berkshire Hills. Uh, didn't really come back to Pittsburgh too much. His brother, who we were just talking about, uh, ran Airbrake, Herman. Uh, Westinghouse. His brother had been in town for a long time. He continued to run most of the Westinghouse industry hands-on. Um, and what other questions? We're sort of about going 45 minutes. No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions or? Okay. I mean, he was into a lot of other. Children? Do you have any children? <coughs> yes. Yes. Um, let's see. He had two children. Uh, I'm sorry, one boy, one boy, just one boy. One, one child died, I believe, in, in childbirth. Uh, so you had a boy. And, and, and I just, I'm in a DVD that they had down at the Heinz. I got to meet, meet uh, George, George Westinghouse the fourth. <laughs> Most of the family lives in New York, as you might expect. In fact, all the families now either lives in New York, Canada, or England. I, I don't think there's anybody here. Even from the Herman Westinghouse, which he lived in Edgewood for many, many years and also had kids. I'm not, but most of the family seems to be out of town that I know of. So I don't think there's anybody left of the town. Because the family much. still own Westinghouse. No, 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 no. I mean, they might have remnant stock, but no, they're no longer, or they haven't been a player for many, many years. Can you say a word about the University of Findlay and how you got there? How I, the people would be interested here that Big Ben's from the oh, yes. city of Ben. <laughs> so, no, I got there. I, I, I mean, my path has been as industry shut down, I moved further west. I was actually in industry before academia. Um, and um, I got my PhD at the University of Toledo, manufacturing management, and I wanted to stay in the area. And, so, showed up at the University of Finley. We, we wanted somebody in operations management. That's what I teach. Manufacturing management. 
It's easier to talk about the history because the country doesn't have much manufacturing anymore. So. <laughs> and you talk more about the history of it. <laughs> I have another tidbit about Westinghouse Air Brake. Uh, my father retired from there 40 years ago. He's been deceased for about 10 years, but his widow, my mother, is 91. And to this day, pensioners and uh, dependents get high mark gap insurance for $40 a month. Yeah. <laughs> Not months here. She was a Westinghouse employee. Oh, yeah. I don't think she gets it. You weren't there long no, enough. I, guess I don't get it. This was built by his employees, by the way, in 1930. It took him a long time to get all the money collection, but it actually was built by his employees, not by the company. When Westinghouse lost his company, did they continue these liberal uh, personnel policies? Yes. So they actually did for a while at the Western House. For, yes, they actually did. The management stayed in place. It, it really did. It was just they wanted rid of Western House. They wanted the, Morgan wanted to control the board. So it, it, I could get into a long story in the book. There were patent fights between General Electric and Western House all the time. Morgan wanted that ended. And, that's, and once he got that ended, he didn't care really how they managed the company. So a lot of it stayed under the old Western House. He didn't like the competition. No, he didn't. <laughs> I was in, uh, I took a tour of Hoover Dam, this happened to be about 50 years ago, I'm a long time yeah. employee of Westinghouse, mm -hmm. yeah. and you see in the turbine built these big machines of Westinghouse, yeah. Westinghouse, oh, yeah. Westinghouse, the times changed, they had a new one, it says Brown Bavaria, and the last one, you know, <laughs> so, they were big, big, oh, yeah. big, he wow. built, and they built a lot of those big in East Pittsburgh in that area. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. They, you know, I talk about in the book, the end of manufacturing, some of the biggest cranes in the world had to be built because of moving those parts in that plant was just <clears throat> very, very difficult. Uh -huh. so. But it all sort of plays, like I say, I mean, Heinz will be out soon, and I, that was sort of, they were friends, and <clears throat> Frick was friends. <clears throat> Sort of, like I said, I'm wearing sort of a pantheon on these industrials. Nobody from Finley, although I did write about Michael Owens from Toledo, I mean, worked in Finley. <laughs> so where is he buried then? In, uh, in Westinghouse is in New York. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, New York. Uh, I spoke to facts. He was buried in New York. A few years later, they moved him, at his request originally, they moved him to um, Washington, D.C. He was a veteran. Uh, or, uh, okay. That's what he wanted originally. I don't know why it took time, but they buried him in New York originally. Well, uh, at, uh, with the use of AC, of course, making everything electric became some, something to do, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, Westinghouse did become an internationally known name. It is still internationally yeah. known, although it's been gone for Yeah, and, and some of you guys might know more about that. Really, I sort of stopped my research at, I mean, I, well, I'm in the engine, but I sort of stopped, stopped about at about when he died, yeah. <laughs> no. But yeah, there's a whole story at Westhouse, and you really, if you haven't been there, you ought to go to the Heinz uh, yes. History Center, because they moved all that stuff down there, and you know, all the old appliances, and uh, you know, it's really something to see. You know. yes. Does anybody know where the appliances made here in Pittsburgh? You know, the refrigerators and washing machines? I think, I I think they sold the name maybe. Yeah, they sold the name a long time ago. I know that. Yeah. White. White. It was white. Sure white. Yeah. Yeah, they sold the name. That's right. Uh, so the name still kicks around on a lot of things, especially even in York. He had about, he had about 30 European com companies, small ones that, you know, did and the name in certain you'll go to York and it'll stand there, out. There is still a Westinghouse Electric Company. It's owned by Tucker. That's correct. That's and correct. It's almost exclusively nuclear. Power. That's correct. It's out in Cranberry where my parents live now. They're they're building a new plant new. in uh, Cranberry. In Cranberry. Yeah. So they're, they're one of the booming. Com in fact, they're the biggest booming company in Pittsburgh they're right now. Them in China. Huge contracts for power in China. Yeah. And yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. They were in broadcasting Westinghouse ones. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Yeah, it was, they said they were into a lot of things. I, like I say, his branch companies, even when, when he died, he probably had about 50 companies on the books into many different things. <coughs> um, 
some of them are still under different labels. There's some light bulb, and I forget the name of it, that's still made under a Westinghouse label. You can still buy a Westinghouse television set. I had no yeah, idea. yeah. I, say, I know they have those in York. Somebody has the name. So the name has been bought, sold, and, and moved around. And he had a lot of companies. And, and his brother, actually, I, I, I don't know, I didn't research much of him. His brother had a lot of money and was into a lot of the businesses. He had a pretty big home in Ed Edgewood somewhere. I've never seen it. What him. was his worst, you know? I really don't. I believe it would be around... I'm guessing from the other ones, around at death, around 20 million. It doesn't sound like much now. We've got to remember that Frick at his death was probably 90 million. H.J. Hines was something like uh, 60 million. Um, Westinghouse is a little older. You know, today, I don't know what, you'd probably times that by about 30 to put it in today's dollars. So. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you know. Frick would be the, Carnegie would, have, would still be the richest man in the world in today's dollars. And Frick would be about eight. <coughs> and Carnegie. Gates would be, yeah, Gates would be about three. So, <laughs> put it in perspective. Yeah, Carnegie, we do know his was uh, 400 million when he died. Wow. Cool. So he, his was a, you can see the difference <coughs> in, in those. And he left it all to philosophy. Right. Because right. he didn't have a family. Well, he did. Yeah, he did. He yeah, just refused to leave it to his family. <laughs> <laughs> he left it to them that they could live out their life and stop. Uh -huh. But nothing was to be passed on. Uh -huh. uh, I met the great great grandson of uh, Carnegie. He, he had to save a couple years to get a flight over here to <laughs> tour <laughs> Brattle <laughs> years ago. This is the 1980s. <laughs> uh, they're not a wealthy family <laughs> anymore. Not like the Rockefellers, they didn't pass it on. Frick left most of his money to charities. Westinghouse left most of his to family, believe it or not. I mean, his relative, he had mostly invested in the companies. To be fair, most of his money, quote, his money, was in his plants. He probably had lots of physical assets there. Uh, you know, but again, his brother owned a lot of it by that time and so forth, the stock. So his personal assets, 20 million, which, like I say, is a lot of money, but um, you know, it might not be his. His house was much bigger than Frick's. Well, Frick's Pittsburgh home, Frick's New York home. And Westinghouse did give Tesla a uh, pension. That's right. He also, like I say, pulled him out in the end. Towards the end of his life, he had to give him a pretty big loan. Just because Tesla had run up so many bills. Um, he went bankrupt a couple times. Um, Tesla was an unusual person. So. He was a genius. Yeah. yeah. He was building a robot in about 1894. Yeah. And he had several, he had a few, some money and some strange stuff with Westinghouse at the end. They were looking at a solar engine together yeah. in, in about 1912, a couple years before he died. And Westinghouse had invested some money into this thing. I'm not sure all the details, but it was going to be a solar engine out in the end of the West. I believe mean, Tesla was finally given the patent for radio. Yes. Uh, instead Absolutely. Instead of more uh, And that was given to him on, yeah, before he died. About, uh, in the, the suit wasn't settled until the 70s, but I think it was decided basically 1950 that Tesla right. had, had. Yeah, so about 50 years after radio, 40 years. Finally. In high school, our daughter wrote a paper on Tesla, and she got most of her information from the Croatian Fraternal Union in Wilkins Township. Yep. <laughs> yeah. information well, they also Wilkins have a lot of his relations. So on the panel with me at, at Heinz a year ago was one of Tesla's relations, oh, and he spends his whole life for not promoting Tesla. He yeah. has the Tesla Society yeah, or something, so they're really... Musical as you meant. <laughs> or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tesla. Tesla is, uh, you might be able to get him as a speaker. He likes to talk to groups. I mean, he's, <laughs> I forget his name, but he's a relate. He's, Tesla's, I mean, Tesla is his last time. I guess he's a director. So, you know. but, uh, but he didn't have any children or wives or anything. Tesla. No. Was in that. It must be a brother then or something. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a cousin. It is a, it is a Tesla, yeah. I don't know. I didn't start. I know Tesla from the Westinghouse then. They, they, it was strange they became such good friends because Westinghouse really wasn't much of a party other than he liked these home parties. I mean, he, he really was not much of a drinker. Um, 
you know, he really, although, although again, he, he, it's strange, he, he had this poker game with, with of course, it was just neighborhood, you know, and they were drinkers, Frick and Carnegie on Thursday nights, but uh, Westinghouse would seem like the oddball in, 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 to me, but <clears throat> maybe not as odd as Hines stopped in once, and he was, he, he was, uh, he, uh, he didn't drink at all, he hated drinking. Was Carnegie sociable with them also, or not? Well, Carnegie moved out, um, not really, Carnegie, a little bit in the early one. Carnegie was mainly in New York after about, uh, uh, he moved out of the shady side, he had a family home in the shady side area, his mother's lived there for a long time, to her death, but he really wasn't here after about 1885, eight, you know, the late 1880s, Carnegie was in New York. They were friends when he was younger, I guess.